Hello everybody and welcome back to our lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for, for this lecture we're going to delve into the careers of the men that comprise the first triumvirate. Uh, that would be Marcus Licinius Crassus, Gennaeus Pompeius Magnus, and of course Julius Caesar. Uh, these three were the most, were the, were the three most unscrupulous men of their generation. Um, they, they were all uh, motivated by personal ambitions and desires and, and a deep grievance against the Senate, uh, the Roman Senate, uh, that, that refused to acknowledge some of their accomplishments and simply give in to a few of their uh, more, more basic uh, commands. Uh, oh, not, not even commands, but just demands. Uh, and then this set, uh, set in course uh, events that would bring together three powerful men to undermine the, 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 the proper functioning and ordering of the Roman Republic. And the first of the men of the, of the first round that we'll look at would be Marcus Licinius Crassus. Now Crassus was, this, uh, was an heir, he was a scion of a very wealthy Roman family. And tragically his father and his elder brother had both been murdered while he was younger. They were, they were both killed um, and, 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 uh, and what was really becoming a kind of endemic purging of your political opponents, and this of course followed the uh, the example set by the patricians who murdered Gaius uh, Gaius and Tiberius Gracchus, the two brothers, and a number of their supporters. Now, Craxus has served as a lieutenant of Sulla. Um, uh, Sulla was a uh, he was one of the the big men who sort of introduced organized violence and the uh, the courting of soldiers to sort of support one uh, as one began his uh, his climb to the ranks uh, to the top of the ranks of Rome during the uh, the the the, um, the the period known as the uh, the Roman Revolution or the uh, death of the Republic. Now Crassus made an enormous amount of money. Uh, he made his money really in uh, real estate. Now he inherited uh, a great fortune from his father, uh, from his family, uh, but he made a great amount of money in real estate. And what he would do is he would have his retainers start fires in neighborhoods where he wanted to purchase property. Uh, and then he would engage in bartering for the property's price while the property was inflamed. Um, while, while the buildings were on fire and the people were looking at financial and personal ruin, Crassus would offer them pennies on the dollar uh, for, for their buildings, for their possession, for their land. Um, and, and Crassus, uh, he, gained, uh, he gained great prominence in Rome following his victory over the, the slave rebellion launched by Spartacus. And it was, it was Crassus who, uh, who, after his success in defeating the, the, the slaves, um, Crassus demanded a military triumph, and when the Senate refused, uh, Crassus, uh, in his frustration, in an effort to vent his frustrations and to show his displeasure with the uh, with, with the with the Senate's prompt refusal, he ordered the crucifying of the six thousand remaining slaves uh, all along the road leading into Rome. Uh, had a punishment, had a vindictive uh, punishment to the Roman Senate. Um, Crassus' chief ambition in life was simply uh, to, to fatten his pocketbook, to fatten his pockets, and he tried desperately to get the Senate to pass various fiscal, uh, fiscal reforms that would benefit him. Now, Crassus also pursued a number of other activities. Um, he also attempted to pursue lucrative state contracts that would, that, that would uh, grant him even more money and in all these efforts, the, the Senate consistently denied him. And so he was much pre uh, predisposed to joining any sort of a agreement, any sort of a clandestine league that would undermine the authority of the Roman Senate. Now, Gennaeus Pompeius Magnus was the son of a wealthy Roman provincial who had earned military fame. And uh, Pompey came from the age of the social war and the various factional strikes afflicting Roman politics. And rather than sit out the, the wars, Pompey decided to raise three legions all on his own. And with his private army, he joined uh, the wars. Um, he joined the wars and he displayed great military capability from the get-go. Uh, in the following campaigns, Pompey earned the nickname the Teenage Butcher. Uh, and that's not uh, and that's not a light term either. He was known for for the carnage. His, his, his battles and his campaigns were known for the rampant carnage and the terror associated with Pompey's attacks. 
Um, after the wars were finished, Pompey returned to Rome where he demanded a triumph. And, and uh, a triumph is simply a military parade awarded to a successful general at the conclusion of a campaign. Um, it was a very, uh, a very high profile, very prestigious affair. Now Pompey was granted his witch because he was a high ranking lieutenant of Sulla. And, and, uh, and Sulla was simply the winner in the latest round of political turbulence. Uh, Sulla had uh, defeated his great, uh, his, his great adversary, a fellow named Marius. Now, the, the turbulence in Rome uh, sort of affected the way Pompey and Crassus viewed society. They needed fame, they needed uh, money, and they needed to constantly be in the eye of the public. Those were the um, the, the those, those were becoming now the recurring factors to power in Rome. Um, Pompey thereafter. Uh, he schemed for more military command, and he, he wants to win more victories. And throughout his career, he is never formally elected to a high office in Rome. Uh, he was not a member of the Roman Senate, Senate, but unbothered, he actively pursues the consulship. And though he was not yet old enough to hold that office, Pompey again gets his way. Uh, Pompey's career does not follow the traditional trajectory. He is a revolutionary. He's doing everything his way, not adhering to Roman customs, not bowing to the wishes of the Senate. He's imposing himself on the entire Roman Republic. Pompey created, uh, uh, he is, he is his entire political career just circumvents the normal flow of politics. Now, after his consulship, Pompey desires more military glory, more military commands. So he wrangles an appointment to command a new Roman force to deal with pirates in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, Pompey uh, has, um, he had a subordinate of his who is serving as tribune propose a new bill that will grant Pompey unprecedented power to defeat the pirates. Now, Pompey going to the east, Pompey is then giving a huge sum of money. He's giving a fleet of some 500 ships and an army of some 120,000 soldiers. Uh, he's also given authority over all the waters, provinces, and eastern governors. All of that was against the, the standing procedure for military appointments for or, or even just Roman co uh, customs. And Roman custom was to divide authority among as many commanders, among as many uh, political office holders as possible, so that no one man can simply generate so much, too much authority, too much power. They wanted equilibrium as much as possible. Now, Pompey, uh, with the might of Rome behind him, he sets out and he defeats uh, the pirates in, in, the, in the span of 40 days. Uh, he then resettles them along the shores of Asia Minor as farmers, and these would be the uh, these would be uh, the peoples of, of uh, Cilicia or Cilicia along the uh, the shores of um, the uh, the shores of the Eastern Mediterranean, um, and what is now southern Turkey with the southern Anatolia. Um, Pompey is not satisfied with what he has done. Um, is, he he has basically uh, expended. His, uh, his great command in about a month and a week. He schemes and he receives a new command, a new expanded command along with a new mission. His mission is, uh, is uh, to go forth and do battle, um, to take his, his army, to take his military command north and to do battle with Mr. Dates, the King of Pontus. Um, uh, and his, his, uh, his, his new command stipulates that he is to remain in the east with this army until Mr. Dates has either been killed or defeated. Now, Pompey marches his armies into Pontus. He defeats Mr. Dates quickly, and Mr. Dates then goes on the run, uh, and he disappears from, from history for a bit. Uh, Pompey is undeterred. Pompey is unbothered. He doesn't care. Uh, he captures Mithridates' kingdom and he transforms Mithridates' kingdom into a province. Uh, Pompey, instead of pursuing Mithridates, he, uh, he goes forward and he takes uh, advantage of his command to the full, uh, to the full limits of, of its advantages. Now, his command stipulated that he was to have command uh, of this army until Mithridates was either captured or dead. Pompey goes out of his way to avoid uh, searching for Mithridates. He did not look for Mithridates. He did not care about looking for, for uh, Mithridates. What Pompey cares about, what Pompey wants to do is he wants to go out 
and he wanted to conquer the entirety of the Eastern Mediterranean. And this was a deliberate attempt by Pompey to emulate Alexander III of Macedon. Pompey heads down towards Egypt, and he defeats Egypt. Uh, he crosses... Um, he crosses the border, and he's informed, uh, and as soon as he crosses the borders uh, of Egypt, he's informed that Mithridates has died. And with the death of Mithridates, Pompey is uh, forced to relinquish his command, forced to relinquish that great army, and he's forced to return home to Rome. Now, Pompey's foreign adventures made Rome and himself extremely wealthy. Rome's tax income increases six folds. Pompey's personal dignities and personal wealth are immeasurable. Uh, Pompey now has gained more wealth and influence than any other Roman before him. Now, while repeatedly breaking with the patrician rules uh, to the game, Pompey's action sets a precedent that, that cannot be undone. Uh, it is now possible for someone to attain great military fame, great uh, wealth, great personal wealth, and great amounts of personal dignitas. Uh, all without not all without um, adhering to this to this long course of uh, of offices that the Senate holds that one must hold before they um, be, 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 before they can uh, even begin to think about holding the consulship or begin to think about becoming a major player on the political scene. Um, Pompey's return to Rome was bitter. The Senate was not in a mood to accommodate his wishes. His request for a triumph was rejected. The Senate refused to ratify his eastern political arrangements. The province making that, that he had done, they refused to, uh, to ratify, they, they refused to acknowledge it. Uh, and, and they refused to honor uh, the pledges that he made to his soldiers regarding be uh, benefits and pensions and access to land. Pompey in, uh, Pompey in response, he goes into a sort of semi-retirement. He did not like previous um, Roman uh, ro uh, Roman tyrants, uh, men, men who um, aspired to be the big wigs in Rome. When they didn't get their way, they prescribed their enemies. They simply made a kill list. And they either sent their soldiers to kill them or, or they simply had the people of Rome. They told them that if they killed these men... Uh, for for them, uh, that if they that if the people of Rome killed the men on the prescription list, uh, they would be given a portion of that man's property. Um, and instead of doing that, Pompey goes into semi-retirement and he sullenly sulks about the city of Rome. He does not initiate violence against his political enemies. Now, Caesar, Julius Caesar, the third man in these in this group in this informal group, the the first triumvirate. Caesar came from a family that claimed descent from the goddess Venus. They were an old family, but one that had fallen on hard times. Uh, his family fought on the wrong side of the last political war. Uh, Caesar was the nephew of Marius, and Marius, of course, was the, uh, the great adversary, the great enemy of Sulla. Caesar, uh, his political career starts off conventionally. He holds minor political offices. He holds them in the right order at the right age. Uh, Caesar begins his career as a protege of Crassus, and it is Caesar who orchestrates the meeting of the uh, who oversees the um, the thawing of relations between Pompey and Crassus, the two former lieutenants of Sulla, who had really despised and hated each other. The three men they go on and they form a political pact, and this pact. The first triumvirate would dominate the affairs of, of the Roman Republic. They they begin to, they begin to, uh, to put their plan in action by nominating Caesar to serve as consul in the year 59 BCE. Um, Caesar completely overshadows his co-consul, a man named Biblius, and, and he rules alone. Uh, he ensures that Pompey's eastern settlement is approved. He grants Crassus's lucrative government contract. He enacts the, the fiscal reforms that benefit Crassus. He approves of Pompey's eastern uh, 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 settlement grants uh, for, for, his, um, for his veterans. He grants both men military triumphs for their past campaigns. Uh, Crassus against Spartacus and Pompey in the east against uh, the pirates, against uh, Mithridates and against the, uh, the, the outlying eastern provinces that, that, that Pompey brought into the Roman Republic. Now, Caesar's Gallic campaign um, is, uh, is, is sort of um, planned out 
during his consulship. Uh, Caesar was very much the junior player in this arrangement. Uh, the two bigwigs were Crassus and Pompey. They were the two most Crassus was the wealthiest man in Rome, and he had the renown of being the wealthiest man. And Pompey was the was the was the principal um, military man. He was the chief uh, fighter, the, the the chief general of the Roman Republic, and he was the best general during his era. Now Caesar wanted the wealth. And he wanted the army. A very common saying about Julius Caesar is that he once said that a man needed two fortunes, one for himself and one to buy an army. And he is plotting how he can uh, gain wealth and he is plotting on how he can gain, uh, he's looking to gain wealth. And he's looking to gain uh, imperial dignity. He's looking to gain some dignitas. Now, what uh, what's happening on the political scene in Rome is that the Senate is angered. Uh, the patricians who are not aligned with Caesar, Crassus, or Pompey, they're angered. Uh, they're angered by the actions of those three men, and they are determined to prosecute Julius Caesar personally. They're 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 um, they're, they're preparing to go after Ju Julius Caesar solely. Once he leaves office for crimes against the Republic. Now, they, they have to wait until Caesar leaves office because Roman officials could not be prosecuted while they were in office. Uh, and so Caesar, uh, he arranges for his immediate appointment to another political office. Uh, after his consulship, he receives appointment as the governor of Cisalpine Gaul, that region of northern Italy. He receives command of, uh, of Kiss Alpine Gaul, and, and, and the, the, the name Kiss Alpine Gaul literally means Gaul this side of the Alps. And that's a, a geographic reference to the fact that North Italy was home to basically, uh, basically Celtic populations. Um, and and the, the region on the other side of the Alps was known as Transalpine Gaul, and that simply means Gauls on, Gaul on the other side of the Alps. Uh, now, Kiss Alpine Gaul was a small, peaceful province. Uh, it was really out in the sticks of ancient Italy. It was not uh, a part of the the um, the urban or the even the commercial core of the Italian peninsula. Um, it was it was a sort of out of the way place, and and, and Caesar's uh, his, his his desire to be given this command uh, mystified his opponents. Um, but Caesar took possession of this small province. Uh, and he was given um, appointment at the governor of the neighboring province, the province of Illyria. And what Caesar wanted to do was he wanted this governorship because these provinces lay next to Gaul. Um, and Gaul was simply this huge, unconquered region stretching from the Pyrenees Mountains all the way to the Rhine River. Well, it's, it extended beyond the Rhine River. But uh, it was just this huge area that encompassed all, uh, all of modern day France and large sections of uh, the Low Countries, uh, portions of Switzerland, and portions of uh, uh, Western Germany. Now, Caesar sees this as an opportunity. He sees these appointment, the appointment to those governorships, has an opportunity to gain a tremendous amount of gravitas and wealth for himself. Caesar raises a private army and he invades Gaul. Uh, and he invades with the uh, with, with the uh, with the intent of spending the next um, with, with the intent of, uh, of going forth, conquering this region, and and garnering for himself tremendous amounts of wealth and tremendous amounts of gravitas. Caesar raises a private army, and he uses this private army to invade Gaul, and he spends the next nine years of his life fighting different tribes, uh, raising legions of veteran soldiers who are loyal to him uh, and, and whom he pays and rewards um, open-handedly to ensure that they remain loyal to him. Now, Caesar proves to be just as talented at command at Crassus and Pompey. Caesar's campaign in Gaul draws the ire of the Senate and his, uh, his, his allies. So a meeting is held with Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus. Um, in which the three of them discuss the uh, the state of the of their affairs, the the, the, the state of their alliance. Um, Pompey and Crassus and Caesar they all renew their alliance and they all uh, decide to give each other new commands. 
Uh, Caesar is uh, extended for another five years uh, in a governorship of his provinces, Kiss Alpine Gaul and Illyria. Crassus is granted the governorship of Syria, um, and Pompey is granted the governorship of Hispania with a special dispensation that allows him to stay in Rome and to appoint a sub commander uh, to do all the duties for him. Pompey is uh, Pompey at this point is married to Julia, the daughter of Julius Caesar. He had this young wife. He's enjoying the, the benefits of his long career, and he had no intention upon leaving his wife, upon leaving um, his, his, his very nice homes, and going back to fight a war. Pompey, is uh, he settled into trying to maintain his position, but not actively going out and, uh, and waging any sort of campaigns. Crassus is older as well, and he re and, and both Crassus and, and Pompey, they're really beyond the age where they should be going out there and campaigning. They're older men. They 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 really should have. Uh, Crassus really should have uh, granted this command to his sons, send his sons with advisors, and, and, and try to uh, grain gra uh, gravitas that way. But Crassus is intent on going out there and and bringing in a large area like Caesar is doing. Um, now the triumvirate falls apart shortly thereafter this this uh, this arrangement because Crassus marshals his forces and he marches in out uh, out uh, from Syria and, and he strikes out to conquer the Parthians uh, and the Parthians are the new Persian polity in the the, uh, the, the, uh, the the Parthians are the new Persian polity in the Near East the Parthians uh they, they lure Crassus into the desert where he is soundly defeated at the Battle of Cairo. He loses, his, he loses his army, he loses his son, and he loses his, uh, his life. Now, the second great tragedy to befall the Triumvirate is that Julia, the daughter of Julius Caesar, the wife of Pompey, she dies in childbirth. She dies uh, in childbirth and, her, and her, her son is stillborn and that dissolves the last bond between the, the members of the first triumvirate. One member is dead, there's only two men and the one bond that links those two men, Julia and, and her child, they both die. Her death and the child's death, it dissolves the last bond between Caesar and Pompey. And now the Senate moves in with a bill ordering Caesar to return to Rome to answer for his crimes. Pompey uh, and Caesar aren't friends anymore. Pompey's a free agent in the win. Crassus is dead. The forces that protected Caesar are now gone. Uh, the Senate is moving in on Caesar. They're ordering Caesar to return home. And, and I have to tell you right now, um, Caesar Gallic campaign was referred to as Caesar's illegal war. And even modern historians come back and we come to the, to the conclusion that there was no motivation for Caesar, there was no real reason for Caesar to invade Gaul. This is simply a war of aggression and the Roman, uh, his enemies, they, they pick up on this as well. They label it a war of aggression, they label it an illegal war and they're non-plucked about it. The Senate is trying to investigate him and, and Caesar is hit with a really hard choice. He can either obey this command from the Senate and meekly go to his enemies or he can refuse and he can place himself above the state. He decides that he and his dignities are more important than the Roman Republic. He crosses the boundary of, of ancient Rome, uh, of, 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 uh, of ancient Italy, the Rubicon River. And there was a long-standing Roman tradition that you do not bring arms, that, that, that is, you do not bring armed men into Italy proper. You, you do not cross the Rubicon. Um, previously, when commanders were coming back in to treat with the Senate or to uh, just appear before them, they did not march soldiers past the Rubicon. Soldiers were always out, uh, always had to stay um, on the other border of the Rubicon. Caesar crosses it with his army, and he had he barrels towards Rome. Um, the Senate and Pompey are caught off guard by the fact that Caesar is going to fight them. Uh, they did not expect Caesar to fight. They did, they did not expect Caesar to react so rapidly. Really, they, they did not. Re they did not expect Caesar to move so fast. He's very fast. If you ever read the uh, the Gallic uh, Wars, uh, the, the commentaries on on the Gallic Wars, uh, written by Caesar, he uses he uses the word rapid and fast 
almost uh, in every sentence. Um, and, and I remember when I was learning it, uh, it when, I, when I was reading it, we uh, we used to joke that we know this was written by Caesar because it's written in such a, a simplistic form of Latin, and that he uses the same words over and over, so it had to be his. Um, that's sort of like a, a little uh, jab at Caesar and his intellectual capabilities. Uh, it was a schoolboy joke, but it's, it's still funny. It still makes me laugh. Um, Caesar is rapidly moving towards them. And the Senate and Pompey, they don't know what to do. They retreat. They evacuate the city of Rome and they head towards the eastern provinces of the empire. And the civil war uh, begins in earnest with that event, with the crossing of the Rubicon and the evacuation of the uh, Pompey and the Senate out of the city of Rome. Now, the Roman civil war lasts a few years and Pompey is eventually victorious over over. Uh, uh, Caesar is eventually victorious over Pompey. Pompey is defeated by Caesar at the Battle of Pharsalus. And Pompey, uh, he survived the battle and he fled to the one last remaining ally that he had, the old Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt. And when Pompey arrives in, in Egypt, he is immediately cut down by the Egyptian elite who are at this point, they're, they're watching uh, with, 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 uh, with bated breath to see who is going to emerge supreme in the Roman world. Uh, and they feared that Caesar would would really get dropped a hammer on them if he found out that Pompey was in Egypt and that the Egyptians did not arrest Pompey or, or hand Pompey over to him. So he's cut down and when Caesar arrives, uh, because Caesar is pursuing uh, Pompey, he is presented with the head of his one-time friend and great rival. Now, Caesar returned to Rome in 45 BCE, and when he returns home, he is the master of the Roman world. He has no co-consul. He had faced the daunting task of, uh, of defeating his enemies, and he did so. And he, and he confronted with another daunting task, and that is reforming the entire Roman social political system and doing it all by himself. Caesar had to avoid uh, appearing... Uh, he, had, he, had, he had to avoid presenting the appearance and, and ruling like a king due to the, uh, the long-standing Roman uh, hatred, the Roman fears of, of, of kingships. Caesar, Caesar initiated a, 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 a series of reforms. Um, and his reform program, it, it, uh, it, its bedrock is in establishing his veterans of Roman colonies, Roman uh, military colonies, uh, communities of... Uh, with what's Rome with uh, Roman army veterans at its core, um, it, it is uh, it is built upon creating these great public works, providing employment for for the for the uh, most of the Roman um, unemployed uh, citizenry. It is uh, rooted in granting citizenship to foreign soldiers who fought for Caesar. Caesar even reformed the Roman calendar, and and uh, and in a very um, in a very telling instance, and you really get the uh, uh, a, a glimpse at Caesar's um, personality and, and at his own insight and his own view on the world, uh, Caesar renames a month after himself. The month that we know has July wasn't always known as July. Uh, Caesar simply renamed the month after himself um, because he's that type of guy. So July is uh is a re is a result of Caesar's uh, calendar reforms. Now the Julian cla uh, calendar, the calendar that uh, that that Caesar put into place, would uh, receive a few minor adjustments by Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. Um, but but it, but this is basically the same calendar that, that we use today. Caesar's biggest problem lay in. Um, and, and how to control the, the political affairs of Rome without looking like a king. Now, he initially had himself elected consul every year. And this angered the Senate, uh, the, the surviving patricians who felt that he was monopolizing one of the available consulships, which he was doing. Uh, and this was literally um, his end result for, for winning that war, for, for winning the Roman Civil War. Caesar, uh, sensing the discontent, uh, turned to Roman tradition and a special government office known as dictator. And this office was appointed to resolve a particular 
issue and were granted only for a limited time. Now, Caesar arranges to be given the dictatorship to reorganize Rome, and, and he, uh, he expands it to a, a lifetime term. He, he, uh, he, he has um, himself uh, appointed or elected dictator for life to reorganize the Roman Republic. This act uh, provoked resentment from the old supporters of Pompey. They gathered around Marcus Junius Brutus and Gaius Cassius Longinus to plot Caesar's assassination. And on the Ides of March, the 15th of March, Marcus uh, uh, Brutus, uh, Brutus and his, uh, his fellow conspirators, they, they approach Caesar, they ask him a series of three questions in the Senate House, and when Caesar refuses, they stab him. Uh, Caesar falls and he dies, and allegedly he dies, uh, he falls to his death and dies at the feet of Pompey, looking up at his once uh, friend, uh, his once former friend and former ally. Now the death of Julius Caesar did little to resolve the uh, the uh, the infighting in uh, in Rome. Um, the heirs of Caesar now fought against one another for Rome, and they fought against the heirs of Pompey for primacy in Rome. The continuing civil war would uh, result in the the formal death. Of the Republic, and really, the, the the assassination of Caesar is sometimes viewed as the the suicide of the Republic because it had such a negative. It, it had literally the the opposite effect um, that the that the uh, conspirators that the, uh, that the that the assassin Caesar had uh, had had intended. Now, uh, the death of the Roman Republic would lead to the birth of the Roman. Uh, uh, of the Roman Empire, of, of the formal Roman Empire, uh, under the the, uh, the Roman emperors. Now we will break here, and we will come back. When we come back, we will look at Roman events following the death of Julius Caesar, uh, and we will, we will look at the new figures who emerge uh, in this post first uh, first triumvirate uh, Roman era. As always, I am Ted. Hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about this lecture, and I will see you guys next time for another lecture.